Hello, and welcome to Required Reading, the podcast that revisits the most impactful books from our childhood. I'm your host, Aaron Bowles. I am a writer, actor, and comedian. And our guest today is Rishi Mahesh. He is an actor and writer from Canton, Michigan, who currently lives in Los Angeles, California. You can find him on Instagram and Twitter at Rishi Puff or subscribe to his newsletter at rishimahesh.substack.com. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Oh, I keep forgetting to do this as part of our intro. What are you reading these days, if anything? What am I reading these days? I am, honestly, I feel like it's really annoying. I have a lot of like craft books, like Actor Prepares. I'm reading like a book on directing. I have a book on like voice and speech for performance, like from college that I'm tapping back into. But also this, like reread last lecture for our um, podcast. And the next book that I have to read is Tennis and Relaxation, which is a book that was written by my old tennis coach growing up. He <laughs> was like a huge role model for me and he just published a book. So um, I have to read his book and then get back to him about it. But that's that's next up. Yeah. But that feels like such a perfect companion to this book. Yes, it really is. <laughs> so today's book is The Last Lecture from 2008 by Randy Pausch. I had never heard of this book before. Since you decided on this one, I've been wanting to know, how did this book come into your life? Like, how is this a childhood book? <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, Actually, let me let me say this first. The last lecture is uh, written by a computer scientist named Randy Pausch, who's from uh, Baltimore, Maryland, which I'm from Maryland, not from Baltimore, but still neat, who has, in 2008, has pancreatic cancer and knows he's about to die and is invited by... Carnegie Mellon to give a lecture about sort of it's a lecture series about like you know the biggest takeaways from your career and he uses it as sort of like a farewell to life and a lasting lesson to his kids who are too young to really know him so how did this come into your life what's your story with yeah that? <laughs> yeah so I mean how it came into my life was I remember I was like 10 or 11 years old or something and I was in the back of my uncle's car on like a long trip somewhere and it was just like sitting in his back seat and I had nothing to do so I like picked it up and was reading it and yeah it's 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 a memoir like it's it's a memoir for like you know that I think was popular yeah in like the 2000s yeah and I read it when I was like 10 or 11 and obviously it's mature on some level it's yeah like yeah. this memoir and it's about like this guy who was like dying of cancer and it's just all of his lessons for life and as a 10 or 11 year old I was I found it compelling and I ended up just like rereading it a bunch over the course of like middle school you know which was odd obviously to be getting all of this like um this this book written by and for people who are much older than me but I thought of it as a kind of roadmap to life and yeah. like adulthood or something when I was like a preteen so yeah that's how I came across it I love that. And I think like, I, even though you were perhaps not like the target audience of like the published book, it feels like you were the target audience of the lecture, nonetheless, because this is a guy writing for his kids about sort of how he made his childhood dreams happen, which I thought was like, as soon as I got to that part in like the second or third page, I was like, this is really perfect for this show. And I think it came out in 2008. And I was thinking about this earlier, 2008 is like uh, the Obama election and, and things like that. I was starting uh, middle school that year. And I was trying to think about childhood dreams, which I think we should we should definitely talk about next. And I was like, I don't think any of my dreams really like I didn't have dreams until middle school, really. That was like the age where you start understanding that the world exists and that you are within it. So like, I think I wanted I want to ask about like, what would your last lecture include? But to start, like, what are some of those childhood dreams? Because I did I have any? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, my childhood dreams were all, I remember mine really vividly. They were all like career oriented, I mm -hmm. think, because that's just like how I was raised. Like my parents were definitely like talking to us about like career and stuff from a very young age. And that was part of even when I read this book, I was like, I understand why it was so impactful to me at that age specifically, because I was like, it is very it is very like traditional Gen X, like American <laughs> values. Like it's very like all of that. And 
that's why I think I responded to it quite differently when I was reading it today, like compared to when I was a kid. But yeah, some of my like childhood dreams were, I think like at the, you know, the first thing I ever wanted to be was an astronaut. Uh, wanted to be an astronaut very badly. Wanted to be a rock star at some point. Wanted to be an illustrator for comic books. These are all things that I remember my parents being like, I don't know. Try again. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Try again. Yeah. And I remember in middle school, I wanted to be, <laughs> I remember, I wanted to be a philosopher. Like, I remember, <laughs> like, I remember, like, coming across, like, you know, like, middle school studying, like, world history or whatever and being like, oh, so some people just, like, sat around and thought about stuff? Like, that sounds great. And, yeah, so those were, those were some of my, I feel like, yeah, childhood dreams. Yeah. Wow. And there's rock stars performance. There's an element of that. Uh, he talks about being an astronaut. He goes to zero G. I think at that time, my childhood dream was like, I had just gotten my braces off for the first mm-hmm. time. And I was like, I have a new smile and it's changed my life. And I want to, so for like a summer, I wanted to be an orthodontist. That's bleak to me just because that is, mm-hmm. I know they're doing a service to some extent, but the pain, the amount yes. of pain that is inflicted. Sorry. No, no it doesn't make sense to me either. I think because I, I've never leaned towards science in any way or math, and those are such science heavy, <laughs> science heavy career. And then I, I just had my top braces, and then when I got top and bottom, it was over. I was not interested in anymore. Um, I also had, I think I had a different orthodontist the second time around, and he was terrible. He like had little money with his face printed on it. It was just a lot. It was a lot. Interesting. Orthodontists are such a specific, like, uh, yeah. I remember my orthodontist being a character of sorts as well. Yeah, it's, there's something so barbaric about braces. <laughs> no, of course. It's, it's, it's medieval in, in a way. Like, yeah. I had so much like orthodontic like stuff from when I was like a child onwards, mm-hmm. like everything you could imagine like going on in a mouth I had. Yeah. It's interesting to revisit this in your 20s. I think, I mean, it was my first visit with it. You're already at, like, I'm in my late 20s and I'm starting to think about like, what what are the big lessons I'm starting to become for a while, I did like a little Zoom lecture for my college about using social media. And so that was odd because it was like, I'm two years ahead of you guys. Like, I don't really know a lot. I'm having a really similar experience right now where someone, there's a, a group from my school that just asked if I would like come and talk to them about stuff, about something. And like, if that would be their fall speaker. And I'm like, I'm 25. Like, what yeah. are you, like, what? could I possibly have to say but I was like yeah sure <laughs> yeah exactly it's yeah. it's very flattering uh, yeah, yeah, yeah to suddenly feel like you have knowledge that other people don't yeah yeah this book is like 52 chapters and it reads so fast 61 but I think like maybe we have like the first 20 chapters or so down or at least the lived experiences what would be some of like the headings in your last lecture do you think what are the things that you're like I at least know this much Ooh, I mean, I don't know. I feel like I don't know anything about anything. I mean, a lot of my reaction to the book, like, was so different reading it at this Mm -hmm. point in life because I I was, like, I see where, uh, as a kid, like, a lot of these lessons, as I mentioned, like, very, like, traditional. I honestly, like, rereading it, I expected that because it was so influential for me, like, when I was a child, I expected that rereading it, I thought as an adult, you know, more or less, it would be even more like applicable, valuable to me now than it was then. And I actually felt entirely the opposite. I just realized that at one point in my life when I was like a middle schooler sort of like forming my value systems, I think it was a lot more influential. I think it was like a lot more aligned with what I was being told by like my parents and by you know my teachers as far as like you know work hard you will succeed don't back down like there are no obstacles that you can't overcome ask for what you want like um, that one I definitely want to circle back to yeah (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. there's so uh, there was some that is don't complain like there's (laughs) A lot of that. And I remember, like, I think it was so influential to me as a child because I was, like, addicted to achievement, like, you know, yes. and and 
yeah, addicted to achievement on the traditional means, like on the traditional metrics. And I was just thinking about how at 25, that is so different. Like when I was reading this book now, like a part, a lot of what I think about it is that like the world is so different yeah. today from what it was like at the time that this was written. And I mean, I think it also another thing that um, made me appreciate the book when I was a kid was like, he's a computer scientist and mm -hmm. a lot of like what he's talking about are, are like these ways to like change variables and like iterate solutions to problems. And both my parents were like programmers, like computers. So it like made sense to me with like right. how I was thinking, but I've grown up and like, that's not like, you know what, <laughs> that's not what I'm doing. That's not the path I'm on. And like the world looks so different. A lot of what happens in this book is like how to succeed and be validated and encouraged within these like institutions. And at yeah. this point in my life, like, and at this point in the world, like, you know, like this is like nearly 20 years post this book, like, the way that like the economy and industry and institution like has revealed itself like over the last like you know decade or two it makes it a lot harder for me to be like motivated or inspired by the yeah. lessons in this book i think to answer your question in this stalling and rambling has now allowed me to find an to feel <laughs> your question i think like something a chapter in the book would maybe for me be something i feel like is that I do feel pretty strongly about at this age, 25, like, is to have your own definitions of success, like, mm -hmm. have your own definition of what success is to you, how you define it. I think knowing your own value system mm -hmm. is so crucial, so important. And part of, you know, me today, like, knowing that having, like, a definition for success and a, and, a, and a definition and a set of, you know, things that I value makes it easy for me to even look at this book and be like, there are things, there are like values ascribed in this book that I don't share. What are some of those values? Um, I don't know. Like, I think, for example, like we were just talking about like mm -hmm. the play that just produced out here in LA. Earlier this year, I also produced like a 24 hour film festival, like for my yeah. career, like one of my values is being like community oriented. Like one of my values is doing things for other people, with other people, in some extent to feel some personal joy, but not necessarily for like personal ambition or like validation. I don't know. Like that's like a value that I feel like is a, a tricky one, like out here. And but it's like a, a value that I have, like a value that I have is like, you know, that your personal success is not more important than other people like that's mm -hmm. a value that I have uh, I feel like a lot of my like day-to-day -day work is stuff like that like you know having a community oriented events that are free like that are creative artistic that, that are not tied to like professional success, that are not like a credit like you know that are not like yeah I don't know if that's like super yeah. coherent, but like that's something that I feel like kind of diverges from the lessons in those book which are like have heroes and they will someday validate you like right. like uh, respect these institutions and they will like and you might get to interface with them like he talks so much about Disney <laughs> in this book which is something that I think like you know Disney is something where like they are selling imagination but then they're they're selling it and you we've seen like 20 years later like from this book now like to me I, I look at Disney as like that is a large corporation that profits off of yeah. the idea of like imagination and creativity and whatever so that yeah the, I don't know I don't know I, I hope that I hope that was an answer yeah I think something that I didn't really realize until now as we're talking about it is that the book and his experience which makes sense he's a professor his experience is so limited to the world of academia which is, you know, one of the oldest institutions, at least in, in this fairly young country. And, and I think academia, for all that it is, I think, it, and I only know, like, very tangentially, like, my mom was an adjunct for, like, a year or two when I was really young. It is not about community. It is sort of right. like, how can I get this from you to get this so I have, like, job security? And in the same way that you're talking about, he, he wants to be an Imagineer. He does, like, a little sabbatical at Disney. And Disney is also an institution. Like, whether you love it or hate it, it is an institution that has, like, a century behind it that is really strict, that, you know, has a, a lot of uh, very strict confines. You're absolutely right about he, he is navigating a very straightforward path. And yeah. in... 
I think maybe just in the arts in general compared to something <laughs> a couple months ago, I saw the I saw half of the movie Daddy O with Sean Penn and Dakota Johnson. I only saw half of it and then the fire alarm at the Grove went off. So everyone left and my friend and I were like, I don't need to see the rest of this. Dakota Johnson's character plays a programmer and she says like most of it is pulling decisions down to is this true or false? And I think that puts obviously like to computer program is to work within binary. And so much of everything we do is there is no path. You have to figure out the path by yourself. There are no right answers. And that for a book that talks so much about legacy, I feel like those little choices don't necessarily like, I don't know, there's always going to be another college, which is maybe not true for everyone. But I, I think like, The two of us, we have both created our own paths to get to where we are. There's a lot of thinking outside of the box. And I think, like you said, this book is like how to succeed within the the lines that are already there. And you're right. It's such a Gen X thing. He only says it once, but I highlighted kids these days complain too much. They're coddled too much. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's that's exactly something I responded to. Like, you know, not to be so, you know, obvious like about it, but it, it, it is like it's a Gen X like white guy. But it, like to me, I feel like it's almost like the rule book for like being a nice, respectable, successful guy. <laughs> like, yeah, no, I mean, I agree. Like it is. And yeah, there's this like sense of bliss, I feel like from the book, like there is a lot of comfort and sort of stability and whatever that he like kind of constantly experiences and where a lot of these um, lessons stuff come from. And I do think a lot of that is great like there's there's also a lot that i do take from the book that i that i do really value like there are things that have like stuck in my head for for years like the idea of like i'm remembering his chapter about like driving like dented cars like that's yeah, of course that i like uh, have responded to there's there's plenty in there that i i do also like but yeah i mean it's just it's not it's not a radical book and It's not a radical book. And I feel like sometimes I feel like today, like the world that I feel like I'm living in requires thought and behavior that just is more radical. So I feel like that is something that I like to like bring to my work. This book to me is comforting in a way because it it describes a life that like, for the most part, has made a lot of sense. And there's some things I don't relate to as well. Mm -hmm. I think it's comforting in that like this man has lived a life he is proud of and has like made peace with this very difficult thing and talks a lot about how hard it is on his wife, which like, I don't know. Of course, it's hard on his wife and I don't want to criticize that, but it also feels kind of weird just to be like, and my wife is great and my wife is great. I think at that point in your life, it makes a lot of sense that he doesn't want to be radical and it is deeply comforting. But I also wonder is the majority of the audience that this book goes out to younger people or older people who are able to be like, oh, well, I did that one. Or like, I already know this one, so I feel better about myself. Even reading it, I feel like one, one thing that I, I feel so bad, like just like slandering this dude who like died of cancer. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, like, whatever. I, yeah, I work, my day job is I, I work at a um, cancer nonprofit. So I also feel like somewhat like, desensitized or sensitized like Mm -hmm. to that experience uh and have like dealt with a lot of loss in like my personal life like even the writing itself I realized I was like oh actually it's not that weird that I read this book at 10 or 11 years old because I was reading it when I was rereading and I was like the writing is so simple like Mm -hmm. there is nothing very complex about the book or the ideas even really in it at all which is not the point and like it is like you're right like it was it is kind of the audience is children and I also wanted to come back to another that you had said about the idea of him being a computer scientist and and there being like kind of true and false and right and wrong and and one thing I think particularly maybe because my parents are programmers yeah. I took some like computer science in college and I really loved the creative element of the problem solving to it and just the idea that when I would like work on code or whatever just the idea that there was a solution like there was Mm. a path and there's like a a kind of beauty in the um like taking something very mechanical and and using it to like create something that you know works like has like truth value to it that like is operational even if anything I, I think about it even with how I you know any of my like artistic practices or whatever like the writing that I do or even like the acting or um 
or even like right now I'm writing uh, with a friend, we're writing a video game, like an interactive oh, fiction nice. sort of thing, like the one that it like has like tree like structures and whatever, which like, and uh, it is coded into a program. And I appreciate the kind of mechanics of that system of like, if this, then this, like, I think that is sort of like how a, a story functions or how like a neural pathway, fun- like a lot of, like, you know, when I think about like acting work or whatever, I think a lot about like mental roads that you're like navigating. There's something to be said, I think, for the the blending of like art and science and like technology and human and the way that that exists in, in this book where he's talking about, like, you know, life lessons that he um, has gotten from this like sort of very uh, type A, like kind of approach to things and it's interesting because on some level i i do um i find that interesting and applicable like you know yes there are no firm paths in artistic life and practice but i know like when i'm writing something i have like a very strong idea of like this doesn't work until this happens like this has to happen for this to work even like putting in the play and like doing it together with my like you know collaborators or whatever there was a lot of like this moment here only works if this here happens like and it feels so mathematical and like I don't know, even though it is something that is so artistic. I I don't know, the um, capacity for both sort of disciplines that is required in both and many disciplines is that stuff, I think, Mm -hmm. really fascinate me. Yeah. You had mentioned there's a sort of like bliss and comfort to it. And I think there is such a comfort in reading it because there are solutions. And he is sort of sitting down and being like, I he's not claiming to have all the answers, but here are all of my answers. And I think it's also like he never he never pretends to be something he's not. But there are parts. The next thing I have pulled up is chapter four, the parent lottery. I won the parent lottery. I was born with the winning ticket. A major reason I was able to live out my childhood dreams. And I was like, great. I was born and then immediately uh, because due to a medical mishap, disabled my mother. And now she can't walk. Right. <laughs> so like not a winning ticket. Not relatable, Randy. But I also think, like, is this a man who just, like, the first hardship he has is cancer? Like, I just, That's that can't be right. Question. That's <laughs> a great question. That's a great question. I mean, you know, me and my, that is something that I wonder a lot about in terms of, like, you know, when you're talking about privilege or, yeah, like, you know, lived experiences. Like, that is something I always wonder about. Like, I think that, you know, me and my friends, like, whenever we're, like, you know, just gossiping or talking, maybe a lot of times, like, you know, a lot of what is invoked is, like, what is, like, a person's circumstance and, like, mm-hmm. and how much do, if you're a person who maybe hasn't necessarily encountered much hardship, like, during your life, in what way will minor slights feel like oppression or hardship? Yeah. And, like, not to say, like, that, you know, as a, as a, uh, relates to to this book, but you know some of some of those ideas I do think find their way into some of the like ask for what you want, like mm-hmm. work hard and you will get what you achieve. There's there's one particular line mm-hmm. actually that your line reminded me of that I have uh, dog eared. Okay, <laughs> there's a line in this book that just always makes me that has, has made me chuckle. My favorite non-complainer of all time may be Jackie Robinson, the first African American to play Major League Baseball. He endured racism that many young people today couldn't even fathom. He knew he had to play better than the white guys, and he knew he had to work harder. So that's what he did. He vowed not to complain, even if fans spit on him. The line, (laughs) he endured racism that many young people today couldn't even fathom. That line... (laughs) Oh, buddy. (laughs) ...makes me... It gets my mind going, (laughs) you know. He endured racism that many young people today couldn't even fathom. Yeah. Yeah, like, I um, I do think that's hilarious that I did laugh out loud at that. It reminded me of the woman who was went viral a couple years ago for saying like I don't try to be relatable. She was talking about like the Hispanic woman who cleans her toilets, and she's like, mm-hmm. I look up to people like Harriet Tubman, and mm-hmm. it's just like you can't just just toss but, that in and and say like you've done it. Kids these days can't even handle a little bit of racism. Like, Obviously, that's not what he's saying, <laughs> but, like, it's just kind of funny to me. Like, he injured racism that kids today couldn't even fathom. Like, I don't know. That's just something about that, like, really just tickles me. Yeah. It's also just, like, Randy, that's not for you to decide, you know? Yeah. And also, like, I'm sure Jackie Robinson did complain. You know what? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And Jackie yeah. Robinson should be able to complain. Like, you know, complain. Getting spit on? Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that's that's yeah, one of those things where I where I say like yeah, like you know, the book is not that radical. To complain can be radical. Like, you know, what Yeah. Are, yeah, it is like, well, was was 
Uh, I know it's like there's the idea of like accept your lot, mm-hmm. work hard, like you know, and um, achieve your goals because they are achievable because there is a whole system that is designed for your success. Mm-hmm. And if you fall, if you are polite and courteous and you know have a good reputation, reputation and are tenacious, like you will be able to achieve your goals. And I think when I was a child, like and I read mm-hmm. that, I was like, oh yeah, I can achieve whatever I want to achieve. And Mm -hmm. I did that, like, you know, for a very long time. And I still love, you know, doing things like obviously, like, I still like, like, you know, having a goal accomplishing and whatever. But I feel like I'm a lot more, I think I spend a lot more time thinking about like evaluating, like, whose belief system is this? And achievement to what end and achievement for what and for who, like, what are my dreams and and do my dreams am i am i the only beneficiary of those dreams mm-hmm. like are there other better dreams? like you know that can yeah. um, do more for more people like i don't know like that is it's something i wonder about like i feel like there i feel like we live in a a society that is all about like personal accomplishment mm-hmm. like it's like what will you realize and you achieve for yourself and i feel like the overall impact of that is like you know, you have so many relationships with people whose like personal mm-hmm. narratives, like and like personal goals and the stakes for their own lives, like are so high. And and yeah, and I just I just don't know how much that idea of like you know personal dreams and like personal uh, achievement or whatever. I just always like the thing I always wonder is like, but what does it do for other people? Like, what yeah. does it do for like the other people that you know, like your community? Like, how does it? we're all just so much more interconnected than that. And there are tons of books like it, you know, like that have this idea of like, how do you achieve what you want to achieve? Mm -hmm. And it's just something I wonder about sometimes where I'm like, I just don't know how much more Americans need to think about personal achievement, like individual accomplishment, like. Yeah. Randy talks about a few people that he like took along the way that he like helped advance. It was cool that he talked about Alice, which is this animation software, because I went to art school. Everybody and their brother in the animation department, which was the largest department, was using Alice for free every day. And like that's that's a huge impact. But I do think like there's just something a little hollow about it, I think. And maybe it's I I think you said earlier, like none of the ideas feel like I haven't heard them before. Yeah, definitely. One of the last chapters he's talking about, um, because it just felt so applicable to our industry, is he's talking about he needs other people to like read a dissertation he wrote. So he gives someone the dissertation with a box of Thin Mints, which I'm a Girl Scout. We love it. And he'll say, like, you can't eat the cookies until you read the thing. So you also get a little reward. There's a way to, like, nudge them along is to be like, have you read that? Have you eaten the Thin Mints yet? And I immediately was like, yes, perfect. I need to do this. I'm sending out a script right now to, like, 20 different people. Perfect, perfect. But it's also, like, that feels like manipulation a lot. Like, it is, like you said, like, how do I get what I want? And I think that, like... Like if I were to give a last lecture, I think one of the things that to me has been so much more helpful and I feel like adjacent to what Randy says is focus on the things you can control. I feel bad saying like he never experienced hardship. I know he talks about like he didn't get into like the doctoral program or something he wants. <laughs> okay, so, that's, the, that's yeah, so he, he like does go to someone and is just like, please, and and gets it. But it's sort of like they're... There's a lot that he describes. I just feel like it's not reflective of the world that we live in today. Mm -hmm. Like, I was thinking about, like, there was something he was talking about of where he wanted this thing from Disney or he, like, just basically calls up this company and is, like, gets on the phone with someone who can make something happen. I was, like, if I try to call my grocery store because I forgot something there, I'm, like, on hold for two hours and they never pick it up. Like, there's just some things where I feel like we live in a world that looks way different one of the things is that it also looks a lot more technological than like Mm -hmm. he's describing like he is describing a world that is honestly more human like when he talks about the cell phone he's like can you even imagine that one day we'd be walking around with our little phones in our pocket isn't like the world of technology so beautiful and isn't there so much benefit that will come from this work like we're gonna Mm -hmm. make the world a better place then on like in the end of the book 
he mentions how he never had a TV because he's like, he thinks of it as a big time waster, but he realized yeah. that when he's bedridden with cancer, like he's going to be watching a lot of TV. So his wife, like, you know, gets him a TV. And he says that he didn't have a TV because he thinks it wastes time. I was like, if he could even see the way in which the cell phone, what that has become as far as like a time waster or something. Mm -hmm. Talk about like Alice or something, the like computer, the technology. I think there's so much optimism in this book for like <laughs> the world of the future, creating like the technology of the future. And I right now, like sitting in like 2024, like am oftentimes wondering like, is there any good that comes from technological development anymore mm -hmm. is there anything besides attention economy and like double digit screen time hours and like infrastructure for like bombs and like military like what is you know obviously there's like medical like mm -hmm. advancement technology there are good things but i don't know it's like in this day and age like in 2024 i look at that so differently yeah if i have the dates right i think 2008 might have been the year of the first iphone Mm. so what a world wow. and i think also like 2008 barely remembering that year it was such an optimistic time it was like perhaps the most optimistic we have been as a country in a long time i think talking about time wasted i think absolutely feeds into the whole book feeds into this productivity hill mm -hmm. that we yeah. have as a, as a culture that i'm trying to to let go of and i think like is time wasted if it's like spent relaxing, if it's spent like doing something you love that is not going to be a final product. And I think something that I like the ask for what you want and you'll get it. I've heard so many times and never it never feels right. And I haven't been able to put my finger on why on why that piece of advice doesn't feel mm -hmm. right. And I think maybe the reason I've come up with is you get one chance to ask. Yeah. I, and that's the thing, like, I, I have really big industry connects who, like, I know like me, but I've known them for, like, five years and I haven't asked them to read anything because you get one chance. Yeah. So it's like, I, I just... It's, that's entirely mm -hmm. correct. Like, I feel like, you know, even in this, like, you know, the process of, like, doing this play or, like, and just, you know, being in LA, being in this industry, yeah. like, whatever, people will act like that. But, like, you know, ask for what you want. It's like, your achievement matters. Realizing your personal dreams, that mm -hmm. matters all else be damned. <laughs> um, and the thing that I was, you know, even as we were thinking about, you know, inviting mm -hmm. people to this play, like asking for this, asking for that, like doing all this stuff to make it happen. It had become so easy to see when someone is like moving in a way that is transactional. And I think there is something really to be said for goodwill and like developing goodwill and like spending that goodwill appropriately. And there was a lot of times I feel like that sort of like thing of like, ask for what you want, like take whatever. There's a lot of times I feel like that sort of way of moving is not at all attached with like, but what is the like human goodwill that yeah. you have with people? How strong is your relationship? There were so many things that we didn't do in the production of like this player that I haven't done in, in a lot of my work because it's like, I have a understanding of how much goodwill I have with people and like yeah. how to use that appropriately. Not to say that like he doesn't understand that, mm -hmm. idea, but I feel you on that. And I think that's a yeah. like, salient point. <laughs> Some of this stuff is less human, like it's yeah. less like it's less involved with like a genuine understanding of what makes people want to do things for other people. Right. Like, with a strong relationship or connection, do you even have to send a box of Thin Mints mm -hmm. along? Like, no, I fully feel that because like I just finished this draft. I'm lucky enough. I had like 20 people who said they would read it and are genuinely excited to read it because we are friends and because we have that dynamic. I went to college and we had two like big film festivals and we had so much training as students like by the faculty of like what to do and what not to do, how to make a good impression, how to talk to people at parties and all of this. But one of the biggest things was like everyone knows you want a job. Like everyone yeah. knows you want something. Yes. So you have to try to make a personal connection. You have to like, that comes later. You have to build something personal that this person like genuinely wants to work with you. And at one point, <laughs> my my junior year maybe, there was this panel and we were having a discussion that was like just the writing kids and one of the creators of Friends, like huge, huge industry person. And the event ends and everyone's sort of milling about and this girl goes up to one of the creators of Friends, and says, can I have a job? And it works. And it works. It just 
it's so rare that that happens. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I think it's because like that person has had the friend's success. That person is no longer like looking over their back to see when the checks will stop clearing. I remember when I was in college also, mm-hmm. and I was like coming out to LA for a summer to work at some production company. I would go to some like college, like networking, like whatever stuff. And I would put myself out there and just do that thing. Like, and I was in like this entrepreneurship class and in, in like my senior year of college. And it was a similar sort of thing. We bring in speakers and sometimes I would like hit them up and be like, hey, can we like get coffee? Yeah. The thing I realized, though, I think at one point is like when it comes to just plain old like networking, whatever stuff, the thing that it maybe gets you or that connection that you have, I find is not that valuable. Like just moving around in like Hollywood, you'll end up with like some like contacts in your phone that are like a big name here or there like whatever but how much is that person really going to like stick their neck out for you if you don't truly connect yeah I don't feel like that stuff goes so far even like you know working as a PA on a big set that is great but in a couple months like we all know how stuff yeah like you know you you do like stuff and it's I I think it's important, like, like what you were saying, like, in terms of being a person who people want to work with, like, just developing that those genuine connections, like, I more so believe in like doing your own work and doing work that you really love. And that is Mm -hmm. really good to the extent that like, the work does it for you. Like, Mm -hmm. work is so good that like, it brings people into your orbit and people connect with you more because of like, also like as like an artist or something, I feel like mm-hmm. you're, the relationship between like yourself and your work is so, for me, it's so strong. It's like intertwined. And these flimsy connections have never really done so much for me, so much as like the connections that are strong, that are really based mm-hmm. on like the work and like what you do and, and who responds to it and having that genuine value in, in your relationship with someone based on like the work that you're doing I always think that'll get you farther than any of the like flimsy connections based on status or yeah. Yeah. Like you said, some of the biggest people like stars whose names I have in my phone have worked on so many projects and so many shows to the point where like they don't answer their phone anymore. And that's okay because they're, you know, they're living in a different stage of life. I think one of the most valuable pieces of information I got was with those festivals at my college, it was never explicitly said, but the understanding was like your career will be made in one conversation tonight. It is like life and death. And the most valuable piece I ever got out of that was like network across. It won't be valuable for like 30 years, but those are the people that you bring with you. Like things take so much time. And just the nature of the book, like that's a guy who's lived through all of it and knows that it is ending and mm-hmm. like n- really knows the the breadth of time that he gets and we don't. But I think like, at least in what we do, everything is so slow. Everything I'm hearing this year, and it's like, it's a rough year, but everything I'm hearing <laughs> is like, it just takes time. And in the meantime, like, I'm like, something that always blows my mind out here is I feel like so many people I know are always talking about our careers, like everything we want, like it's all the ways to eventually do what we want. And the thing that confounds me is I'm like, I know so much about what people want, but I know so little about what they do. Like, I know so little about the work that they make and that they love and that they like, you know, whatever. I'm like, yeah, things take a long, 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 long time for sure. And I feel so blessed that we have all this space and room and time to do exactly what we want in like big grand ways. Like two of the most like rewarding, fulfilling like experiences I've had in this last year have been like when I produced my 24 hour film festival and when I and like this play that I just produced. I spent money on both of those things. For the play, I feel like the really amazing, awesome thing about that was we didn't charge for tickets, but we made up all of the costs and donations. Like wow. people like we had, you know, just like donation link or whatever. We offset all of our costs, but we're donating half of that money to Palestine. And like, that's awesome. Like that was, like, yeah. a, there was a, a cost to that or whatever. But I'm like, in this time where we like have all of the space to like make whatever we want. I'm like, there's just so much room to like put the things into the world that you do want to see. Yeah. And to get to make stuff. And I feel like that, like, I mean, two other things, these are like related to the book yeah. are and related to your point, like, is that so many of the chapters happen in the later stage of his life. Mm -hmm. Like, he talks about his childhood, and he talks about his adulthood. But there's honestly not a lot about, like, specifically these years. There's definitely, like, a recency bias, certainly. Part of what it makes me think about is exactly what you're saying, of, like, a lot of stuff doesn't happen until later. 
you know? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of what he's describing as his most meaningful moments are things that happened much older than I am right now, which is so surprising because every day I am alive feels so meaningful. Yeah. Um, I hadn't noticed what you're saying and you're absolutely right. Your 20s feel like a sort of a I can't think of the word, like a gaping hole in this book. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I think of when I realize that is like, yeah, because he was in college all that time. Yeah, like he was, true. how many degrees does this man have? Like those years certainly weren't wasted, but they were certainly spent in a very structured way. Yeah, it's interesting that he doesn't talk about that because I mean, mm -hmm. I have so many friends who are in like PhD programs or grad school or like whatever. It's interesting that he doesn't talk about those years much. It's, it's like so offhand. Like, he talks mostly about his life after the PhD. That's interesting to me. Yeah, I think maybe the only real story or anecdote I can remember from that is is meeting his wife. And I yeah. think that's near yeah. the end. Yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting. And then the other thing I was thinking about was just, like, you were talking about the way that he gets to go out, kind of. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm, like... Cinematic. Yeah. yeah, cinematic. And I'm even just thinking about, like, from, like, an artistic perspective or mm -hmm. whatever. The idea of being given like that finite time. Yeah. And, he like, knows he's going to die. Yes, yeah. And, like you get to choose how to spend it. And it is a horrifying way to go out. Like there is, I've seen like cancer <laughs> up close and like in the later stages, like it's devastating. But yeah, like but just that opportunity to get to really like package things up, I think is, that's quite a blessing. And he also, there's something to be said. I think the part of it that maybe resonates the most is like most in the positive way, I'm I'm yeah. I'm doing my best to like like balance <laughs> out the like uh, shit talking with um like also some of the appreciation I have mm -hmm. for there's a lot of perspective in the book that I think is mm. really useful like the idea of having a few months to live and like how do you spend your time what do you worry about versus not worry about like that all I feel very strongly about like just that like in any given moment, even when, when we're as young as we are, like the time that you spend is precious and valuable. And yeah. and how much do you spend complaining about a situation versus like making the best of it, making the most meaningful experience out of it? Like, I think that is salient and is something that I definitely like carried on uh, through my life in some way or another. Yeah. I think a big value of the book is to make you reflect on your life, to make you sort of think about what are the things that really matter to me. And I think I'm noticing, like, I don't love the don't complain part, but I I understand the nuggets. I understand the, the, the value there. And maybe I would change it to something like focus on the things you can control. Uh, yeah. Because even saying, like, don't complain is a negative. It is sort of just mm -hmm. saying, like, don't do this. But I think, like, one of the big things that it's making me think about is a phrase that my boyfriend introduced to me, which is don't save the candles, which is... If you are like always have a, a special like birthday candle or whatever, and you never ever use mm -hmm. it, then what's the point? You you have yeah. to use it now. And I think you were talking about like those really enriching experiences, and this ties into the don't complain thing. Is like if you want beautiful things in your life, you have to make them happen, yeah. and that's I think so it is in the heart of the book, but not explicit. When I was thinking about what's in my last lecture, mostly it's like the stocks are not impossible to understand. <laughs> And like never carry a balance on a credit card. And that's wow. kind of it. But it's it's those things. And like there's like I think a Maya Angelou quote of like, don't set yourself on fire to keep someone else warm. You know, that's it's those things. But it's also just like listen to yourself. I, I think I'm still learning what those childhood dreams are almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's one thing um in terms of the don't complain, I would mm -hmm. say like maybe don't complain that much in public because yes. complaining <laughs> might like complaining might make people like you less. Like that is real. Absolutely. As much as complaints are valid, a lot of people don't like to hear them. I, I feel this way sometimes. Like, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes even just the experience of being around a negativity, even, even valid negativity, a lot of people just don't want to engage with it because it's hard to hear a valid complaint sometimes is hard because you're like, or like I feel some sometimes or like to hear a valid complaint is like, I know the complaint is valid. It makes me so sad or upset to know that something is sad or upsetting. I wish I didn't. There's so many little amendments I would maybe like, you know, make, but that's, yeah. I guess like we all have the power to do exactly what this guy did, which is just to like, um, think about all of our own like rules for living. And I, I'm sure we have so much and I'm, and I'm, I am very interested to think like if I was as old as, he was what would be the experiences that like yeah. gave me the sort of fulcrum moment yeah just so interesting because if I think about any of the the big things from like my last year it would be like mm -hmm. start working on the set pieces earlier right 
Yeah, it's it's these little aphorisms like you said that and it makes me think of like the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago and the second best time is to plant it today. Yeah. I'm also trying to think about like what would be part of my parents last lecture. Mm, like yes. my my dad's about to turn 70 and retire from his job and some of the like the most concrete statements yeah. that I know my dad is an architect and every once in a while he'll come home from work and be like don't be an architect Darren. <laughs> <laughs> when I think of my dad I think a lot of like deferred dreams mm. which is why I know he like I have always wanted to be a writer and he has always been supportive of that, which is great. But I think you were talking about sort of what are your dreams when you're a kid and they're all very career oriented, which I think is also like a structure of sort of the system of how we talk about stuff. But like, I remember you saying like, let's think of a more like reasonable, helpful, financially profitable yeah, dream. That was a big part of, of yeah. how I was raised for sure. Did Randy get to dream a little bit more? I mean, Randy, because he was at camp, he did not technically get to see Man Walk on the Moon as it happened. But like that... He was yeah. at camp. Like that was something that like <laughs> I remember thinking in that moment when I read that chapter. I was like, I was not going to camp. <laughs> like, But it is like his generation, my, my dad, exactly the same. My dad wanted to be an astronaut because he saw Man Walk on the Moon. And it's like, God, was our equivalent 9-11? Like, what was that? <laughs> like huge moment moment you know and, and i feel like the closest thing we got is the obama administration and then like look where that ended up yeah like i think there's this promise of like hope and security and stuff in achievement like i know like my parents were immigrants in the 90s and definitely started with nothing here and i know that when i was a kid like a lot of yeah they would offer edits to uh, yeah. the like dreams that I had like based on their anxiety their financial anxiety like you know their anxiety about the world and stuff they weren't necessarily parents who were saying like be anything you want to be or whatever yeah until later in life but yeah a, a lot of it did come from that place there's a lot of security in institutions in these like kind of definitive career paths like safe mm -hmm. options like whatever there is a lot of yeah like again like we talked about the like bliss and comfort in this book mm -hmm. like a lot of it comes from exactly that sort of place which is totally valid but I think about you know you're talking about like the Obama administration mm -hmm. or something yeah like I, I think about that so much like you know when I watch something like the like DNC like today mm -hmm. or whatever like there is so much uh, comfort in this idea of like come in here and achieve with us and accomplish right. with us and you will be safe and you will be taken care of and you'll be like a part of like the fold of society yeah it's a lot less comfortable to like be on the margins in, in some way or another. But yeah, um, uh, yeah I, I think about maybe was the greatest moment of hope we had like the morning of the 2016 election and then how quickly and how severely that came down. I think the thing that lacks in this book is is he has this mentality of like everything is possible. And I think women, people of color, queer people, I think like we all know there's an asterisk on that from the very beginning. As soon as we start understanding things it's like everything is possible except for me like except uh getting treated fairly in a workplace and making an equitable amount of money and uh everything is possible if you wear a bra and wear the right kind of clothes and dress up in the right like there's and it's just really hard to tell people that their basic conception of the world is inaccurate to your basic experience of the world yeah and obviously we can like understand the book for what it is and then there's sometimes it is I really like understand and like relate to that feeling mm -hmm. of like engaging with a, a book like this and being like well the world isn't the same there are obstacles or whatever but then sometimes I'm also like knowing though like when I read this book again like when I was saying earlier how I felt like like rereading this I'm like oh yeah this is kind of just like the the rule book to being like a nice white guy and so there's like to some extent where I'm like if this is really all it is, it's funny to me to remember like sort of that maybe it's possible that even the like, if everything was equitable, like, is this all you would have to have in your head? Like, it's just, oh, yeah, be nice, do your work, like, be like, you know, considerate towards other people. Like, here's some like hacks to like get off of phone calls or like, whatever. yeah, and um, yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 sometimes it is nice kind of to remember like, that plus all of the other little like rules that you need to even like be able to see the world that way that sometimes it's nice to know that like if this is the simplest it is that yeah. at least is totally understandable.
I, I'm starting to have a very dark thought, which is not fair mm -hmm. to Randy, but was the most special thing about Randy the way he died? I'm thinking about oh. like tall poppy syndrome. You know, the, the people who stand out the most are the ones who get cut down the first. The people who who make wow. themselves, you know, the, the tallest poppy is the one that stands out. So I definitely am going to cut that one first. Mm. So at any point, was Randy really, really trying to make himself different? I wonder because they're like a little like a little um thread in this book. I also think it's so funny because <laughs> I just do not think this book like was meant to be analyzed in this way no but, no no uh, you know and i'm no so it's like an airplane book yeah exactly i'm like so happy that it is though like it, something i wonder about is is all of the people who he references like that all of his friends have like poked fun at him for his for the way that he is like painted mm -hmm. himself for the way he's painted in this lecture and i think like it's really interesting to note that it is a lecture written by him about mm -hmm. his life about his character like i don't know him i don't know if there's an mm -hmm. element of like revisionism or like whatever there but he does mm -hmm. he does discuss the shit that he gets like mm -hmm. from other people about about the character that he portrays in the book and yeah i wonder about the like selection uh mm -hmm. bias of these like moments and stories he also talks about like being like perceived as a jerk like and i was just thinking about like yeah like this like computer nerd who thought he was smarter than other people i can see for a huge portion of these life experiences i can see you know i'm curious for sure yeah if there is some element to um painting himself in a certain light like mm -hmm. you know for the purposes of this of this book and and you know with the like maybe lens that like a terminal illness gives you in those sections you're talking about when his friends are making fun of him he gets called saint randy which is like okay but you also put it in the book like you're poking fun of yourself but you're also claiming it a little bit by putting it in the book i think like was his greatest goal really to just be good at this path Mm -hmm. One of the highlights I have pulled up is have something to bring to the table because that will make you more welcome, which is is like I <laughs> I, I think it in 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 terms of productivity, it's like, do I have to be productive in order to be valuable or am I valuable for the fact of existing? Yeah, like it's like that's another quote where it's like to, to me, I would think like come to the table and be ready to be a good listener. Like, yeah. like, you know, that that might be my personal thing. If like what's in my head, like, like, I think there's a lot of people who I feel like come to the table, have something to offer. I personally feel like sometimes the thing that helps me like with a social interaction or with a like a business thing or something is come prepared to listen to people mm -hmm. and like sometimes the best thing you can be in a room is a good listener like yeah and it's so hard to be a good listener when the voice in the back of your head is what am I getting out of this and how yeah, am I exactly. advancing myself yeah and I think it's funny because I do feel like that's a little bit of a generational like mm -hmm. thing also like you know like at one point success for a certain generation was like you know moving mm -hmm. like industry moving also maybe what kind of attitudes allow you to be in a social strata such that you can have a book published like mm -hmm. then you like you are a professor like I don't know yeah. like, you know there yeah like more radical ways of thinking and being like things that are maybe less self-serving maybe less maybe it was much harder to be that kind of individual and like to get to lecture to a group of yeah people. like and he talks about it in the beginning like he talks about like the um self-importance and gravitas that like made him want to do this lecture like do this book like I can't pretend not to relate to that. Like, I, I have a Substack newsletter. Yeah. And in that, like, I get to write about my own life and, mm -hmm. and paint it however way I so choose. And it is one of those things that I'm, like, constantly wondering about as, as I, like, write, like, you know, how am I portraying myself? Like, is this honest? Like, like would the people in my life, like, back this up, this portrayal? I think maybe, maybe a part of from reading this book, like, at a young age and, and having those questions, like... The thing it always makes me think of it, about that is like it matters how you treat people and how you engage with other people such that if you were to sit down to write about your mm -hmm. own life. That's always the thing that like whenever I wonder like am I characterizing myself honestly like is this accurate I also wonder something that alleviates that is trying to go through my life and be mostly pretty cognizant yeah. of like, how I engage with other people such that like. I can do that sort of work from more of a place of confidence. I don't know. Yeah, that's true. I, I 
found myself wishing that we got to hear from Jay, his wife, and that we got to hear from other people and how they responded to this and their perspective. Yeah, I, I think the... And maybe I've had moments like this, so I can't speak to this, but they're like, you mentioned that he has to be told that he's a jerk sometimes or that he's perceived as a jerk. And maybe this is like a identity question. Like, have either of us gotten the ability to not have that situational awareness to like not because Randy could be a jerk and still succeed? The same chapter as as have something to, to bring to the table, the very last sentence is, if you can find an opening, you can probably find a way to float through it. And I think the word float is the thing really getting my gourd because you like, yeah, I, I think absolutely. for so many people, it's like fight and crawl and drag. I know, yeah. Literally. Yeah. I think about that even, you know, in regards to if I think about my own experience in like entertainment or something specifically, I'm like, yeah, like, you know, I feel great about like the stuff I've been able to do in the last like couple years and stuff but i'm like yeah the idea of floating i'm like it's not been floating like mm -mm. any of the work that i've been involved been involved with recently it's been like i know that nobody is handing me anything like yeah. there's been no floating involved it's yes. there's there's been a lot of great things i'm very grateful for yes it has been clawing and building yeah. i sort of floated into acting because i was crawling and dragging my way through writing like I I got the my first acting gig because I was found through Twitter and I often say like oh I got so lucky you know this is out of this world which is true I was also posting a video every single day on TikTok or on Twitter for two years every exactly. single day that's how I got my management as well mm -hmm. like that sort of thing but exactly it's <sighs> imagine floating in you know there are Sometimes you can go viral once and suddenly get invited to insane places, or you can have, you know, seven viral videos and still really be trying to, to get seen. Yeah. And I think in our industry, obviously that's changed so much mm -hmm. in just like the last like decade. And it's funny because it's like, you know, I feel like I was going to say it might not be easy for anybody, but like just what you're playing with, like where, what the, how big. How big, like how big those openings are to float through mm. is definitely a thing. Like, you know, is, is life easy for anybody? No, of course not. Like, you know, he, his life is hard. Like in this book, it is hard. Like life is hard. Like life is a challenging sort of thing. But then yeah. it's like, you know, then when you, but when you do think about like what he describes of like, but specifically life as you pass through institutions, like yeah. institutions are something different. Yeah. And I, and I do think that, um, yeah, I, I, I respond similarly to mm -hmm. those points and stuff, but yeah, like with the, um, with the idea of like entertainment, like pulling in, in like, it's funny because, um, you can never really predict like what the landscape is now is completely different from what it was like five years ago, 10 yeah. years ago, like whatever. And, and um, yeah, that's part of why, like, you know, when you have this book, which is all like all full of all this advice, but like, really like well-meaning, like kindly Absolutely. worded, like advice for like how to go about getting what you want. Like, it's interesting because I, I just sort of feel like, you know, in this sort of landscape where you never know how to get what you want, like, that's where I'm like, and you're also getting me fresh off of like, like having yeah. like, up like this weekend. But like, that's where I'm like, I feel so much more like do what you love, like do things for other people, like do things to show and bring to other people like that is doing what you love. That's how I felt like as far as in the last month or, or whatever, it's been like, it's felt less like I'm like, oh, I'd like to be an actor someday. It's more like I'm an actor right now. I'm acting yeah. like. I wonder how I will view this book. I'm 26 at like 42 or 52 and to keep going like that. I'm very glad to have read it and to know that it exists. I had no idea that this existed. It's like really popular amongst a certain demographic. Mm -hmm. Like I think a lot of like dads know it. Yeah. Think and get rich. I don't know. Seven uh, effective sure. strategies. It's, it's like a little more like uh, wholesome and yes, kind. A little more wholesome than that. I agree, but I think, but that's because I feel like I do think like with like late stage, you know, there's been a uh, like shift in the kind of mm -hmm. the the book and the kind of mentality. I think it's a lot, a little bit more like cracked and neurotic like now <laughs> um, when it comes to achievement and whatever. But this is definitely that book of like 20 years ago when mm -hmm. you know 
brains were a little smoother maybe and like you know just a little bit more like i think that life was a little more idyllic or closer to not saying like you know 2008 obviously horrible financial situation and mm -hmm. um etc but you're right like obama era optimism mm -hmm. that sort of 90s like sitcom full house like sort of yeah it's that book it's like of that era like i do yeah. think it's like not necessarily a book that a lot of people in our mm -hmm. like, age bracket would be aware of at all like again it's a book that like i had to like pull out of like the back seat of a car like of your just, uncle's car which is exactly. hilarious like i think yeah. that is where it is in households yeah America. it makes more sense that your uncle had it than you did certainly certainly yeah. well is there anything about it that we have not covered that you know you wanted to touch on? When I was reading it again, I was like so excited yeah. to discuss it. Like I really started taking, uh, I started taking notes. Because there are some things that he says that I'm 100% behind. He says yeah, filing everything in alphabetical order, 100%. Mm -hmm. That is like, Randy, that, whew. Yeah, the, yeah, there's a ton of um, great little pieces um, in there. One thing that I wrote that I don't think I've covered is that, um, mm -hmm. that I thought would be, I read a lot of it. Have you seen uh, the Before trilogy? Uh, I've seen the first one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I was thinking of, okay, great. <laughs> I was thinking about how much he reminded me of Jesse in that book. Like as I was reading it, the idea of this like white guy, like floating through life and like, and like denoting all of his like philosophies for like existence for like a life that has mm -hmm. all been very chill and normal. But like some chapters, I think as I was reading, where I was just like reading it in like that voice from like that character from that movie, where I was like, you know, this guy who like has all the wisdom in the in the world to offer. Which again, I can't really critique, given that mm -hmm. like when I was in middle school, I wanted to grow up to be a philosopher. But yeah, Ethan Hawke in Before Sunrise did just read this book. Yeah, yes, it is yes. in his little backpack. Yeah, yes, definitely, 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 definitely. Yeah, yeah. But something I really loved about Randy, which he talks about, don't obsess over what people think. Mm -hmm. And I think Randy is not the right person to convey this because mm -hmm. I love what he's saying. But at the same time, he says, you don't ever have to worry about what I'm thinking, good or bad. I'll let you know what's in my head. And it's like, God bless you, Randy. I wish I knew you. I wish more people were like you. But that simply is not the case. Yeah, I, I like that section also. Like, um, or I was thinking about that. Like, that is a section that I am that I have found is kind of evergreen because I feel like people do really mm -hmm. worry about a lot about what people think. And I really value being pretty explicit like with whatever's yeah. in my head and I have a lot of friends who I feel like are really similar so yeah there's there's little things that I'm going through at this point I really like that I'm not going to be a parent I'm never going to be a parent but he t says that parents talk about giving children self-esteem and it's not something you can give it's something you have to build and that blew me that's interesting because I do agree with like I have a lot of thoughts about self-esteem like in general and I do think, yeah, self-esteem is something that has to be built or whatever. I have absolutely no idea about what he's talking about in terms of from the parenting perspective. Like, I know so many people with self-esteem issues that will draw direct lines yes. to my parents were critical. Like, I'm really curious about self-esteem being, like, negatively developed through, like, positive experiences with parents it's, I don't know like that that's yeah. what I don't know anything about parenting though like I have no idea but that was definitely one of those things where I'm like I don't exactly know how to talk how to express this thought but it's like stop spending time on reverse psychology and just just straight up psychology me of like maybe if you just tell me I did a good job then I will believe you that I did a good job yeah, yeah. yeah I think so many of the kids that get described as coddled are now growing up and have the ability to talk back and we're saying like no I was really unhappy actually I like living on the other side of that it's just I wish I had more yeah, self-esteem built up. Yeah. And because, yeah, like a lot of self-esteem, I feel like has to do with narratives in your head, like like a narrative, like I'm not good enough. I will never be good mm. enough. The work I do is not good enough. Like, and I'm just thinking about like, yeah, like where would those narratives come from? Like, and he's talking about like, oh, don't give your child too much praise. They need to work to develop their self-esteem. I have no idea how he raises the kids or how he was raised, but like, yeah, something about there like just makes me wonder if that's like, I don't know if Randy necessarily had the self-esteem figured out. 
yeah it's the like the raising of kids or anything i mean these kids also were young like you didn't yeah it's a hurtful thing to say from me to randy i think all of his parenting advice and maybe it is there and i just didn't clock it should have like an asterisk of like I've only done this for so many years. I think something yeah. that like my dad used to say to me that was both helpful and annoying. I'm an only child. My dad would say like, this is our first time doing this too. <laughs> yeah. And I think to a degree, it's helpful to know that your parents are people. It's also hurtful in the moment to be like, but you're supposed to know how to do this. Like it's you in this relationship, in this dynamic, you are supposed to have the answers for me. But I think it's I also know. like, when do you get to, when does yeah. that era switch? Yeah, I know it's interesting. Yes, it's interesting because I've specific, I've heard that specific advice, like, or that specific phrase of mm -hmm. like, like it's your parents first time doing this too I have also heard that in a positive light and it mm -hmm. is one of those things that's made me like like yeah like it's one of those things that has like led to like you know developing for, but that forgiveness like for mm -hmm. but that's exactly the sort of thing it's like hard to say anything cut and dry when it comes to like the raising like the developing of a young mind and voice if anyone mm -hmm. has figured that out like I'm yeah definitely curious because we're humans like you don't know anything. which again is like I would love and maybe they're going to pull this out soon in like 2028. I would love like a new printing of this book with like a little essay by each of his three children because it is a letter to them. Yeah, I, I, I had that thought too. Like I, I, I wonder about like, yeah, what their lives, like, you know, being handed this, yeah. this book or that, you know, this lecture from their parents and, and from their dad. And I wonder, yeah. Yeah. So I think on the whole, the broadest stroke what was it like revisiting it? How do you feel having come off that experience? Yeah, I mean, I feel good. It, it makes me somewhat feel like this way that I felt in this like part of life where I kind of feel like I have mostly sort of handled and processed a lot of my like childhood and early adolescent like complexes and like whatever. And I feel like I'm kind of lately I felt like I'm really like on a road to a great like adult life that I'm really like happy and satisfied with. Revisiting this book really made me realize like I am a fundamentally different person yeah. than I was when I was like 10 or 11. And one who doesn't really need like this guy's memoir or someone else's memoir so much as I feel like I have my own sort of experiences that have been important and valuable, my own values and lessons that I live by myself. And yeah, I feel good having read it uh, it, as I like, you know, as an adult, which was kind of my, my goal in, in, in yeah. the book. And yeah, if anything, I feel really hopeful um, about life and stuff. Yeah. Um, and feeling this sort of absurd sense of possibility given that what was my rule book maybe when I was mm -hmm. like 10 11 12 is is no longer applicable it makes me think a lot of possibility yeah it's that you you have your own rule book which I think is is the whole point of growing up you know I, I think the book certainly did its job when it got to you yeah absolutely and I'm sure like you know it's influenced me in in tons of subliminal like you know whatever sort of way so I so I do have gratitude for it mm -hmm. even if I have like a critical lens on yeah on Randy today. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to knock on wood that I <laughs> that hasn't been like any sort of like that there's no sort of spiritual like um <laughs> to having but whatever like he's a professor like Yeah. He, yeah. He's... And it's certainly I mean this book's been out for 16 years. It can't we can't be the first ones to have something to say. It does it just feels a little rosy and I think that's its job and what it should do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. 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 Would you consider it required reading? I'm going to say no. I agree. I'm going to say no. Maybe like maybe 16 years ago, but not in the world that we live in today where yeah. cell phones have become monsters and Disney is a monopoly. Like, I just don't know if today the book is applicable um, yeah. in the same way. Yeah, I think I like the concept of a last lecture. And yeah. I think like... A couple weeks ago, I was at my parents' house, the house I grew up in, and I was looking through a lot of my grandpa's stuff. He passed like a decade ago, but no one ever went through his boxes. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's like I would want a last lecture from him or, or all of my grandparents, you know? It's it's a nice yeah. idea. But in terms of the actual contents, I feel like maybe you would get more out of it watching like the lecture itself. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's an element of it that I, I do find beautiful, like in terms of, uh, you know, when faced with mortality, like what do you want to share? And yeah. I think that 
that those are moments that, you know, we can all be grateful for if we do get to have that sort of relationship with someone in our life who is passing mm-hmm. or yeah. And I think like, yeah, the um what you can receive like from the experience of someone who is nearing death or something is so valuable and yeah. so beautiful. And I all wish that we could like that we could really like squeeze every last drop mm-hmm. from like the people that we love before they leave us and with some of the people in my life who have passed away I've really 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 tried to do that and I think that this book is possibly a great inspiration and influence towards that yeah it feels it feels so personal there's a degree of like this should be just for his kids I think Mm -hmm. that I felt but I'm so glad it exists yeah but not required for me (laughs) yeah yeah not required not required at all well thank you so much for coming on the podcast absolutely thank you so much for having me is there anything you'd like to plug as we round out? Not really, not really. I, yeah, I'm kind of finished with most of my like things for the year. I feel like I have a bunch of little projects coming up a little bit. I'll send you that interactive fiction yeah. thing when I'm done writing it, but I feel like mostly I'll just plug taking a walk outside and going to the park Oof, hell and, yeah. um, and eating some nutritious food. Good. Yeah. yeah. Let's end it there. I'm going to press the stop button. Hell yeah. Hello, post-show recap. I'm really proud of this one. Thank you so much, Rishi. This, I don't know, I feel a a special way about it. If you want to support the podcast, please go to buymeacoffee.com slash required reading. The next book, scheduling, it's it's a crazy time of year. It might be 13 Reasons Why. It might be Mercy Watson Goes for a Ride. And you know what? Let's just throw it in there. It might be Wuthering Heights. That's what's going on in the universe of uh, this podcast. I'm Erin Bowles. Thank you for joining. You can find me everywhere at Erin R. Bowles. And I asked you to keep your fingers crossed for me last week. Please do that again. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye.